As drones continue to become more prevalent in the media, there is also a concerning amount of reports of people contacting the authorities complaining that a drone pilot is doing something that they don't like. Karens, if you will. So what can you do as a drone enthusiast to avoid the FAA coming down on you as a result of someone filing a complaint? Today I'm going to tell you seven ways that will help you possibly avoid the wrath of the FAA. Hi everyone, Russ here. Nice to have you on the channel again. So there seems to be an ever increasing amount of stories about people contacting the FAA and complaining about a drone pilot possibly doing something illegal. Now, sometimes these complaints may actually be valid. There may be someone actually flying unsafely or with ill intentions that might need to be investigated. But many times these complaints are from people who are simply just ignorant and they feel entitled to police everything around them. Oh, and for those of you who are just about to comment about me using the term Karens, just chill. It's just an expression. I'm certain that most Karens are wonderful people. I have a cousin named Karen and she's a sweetheart. So anyway, what can you arm yourself with to get the FAA off your back if they happen to contact you? I have seven things today that you can do to help protect yourself. And these tips are relevant whether you are a recreational pilot or someone that's flying under a part 107 distinction. Pretty much in a nutshell, it all comes down to preparation. Preparing your drone and your flight plan, preparing for weather, and checking the airspace. Step one, if you fly a drone that weighs over 250 grams in the United States, you have to register it with the FAA. As a recreational pilot, you register once and the same number goes on all of your drones if you have more than one. Now as a Part 107 commercial pilot, you must register each individual drone. Now it's a pretty simple step and the absolute most important one to stay in the good graces of the FAA. Step number two to avoid the wrath of the FAA is to have a pre-flight checklist. Now a pre-flight checklist is just like it sounds. Check everything before you launch your drone. You can either make one on your own or simply just Google drone pre-flight checklist. Now I use my own, but I just found this one here yesterday. It's actually just a checklist app that has a whole bunch of different checklists on it, but it has one for a drone pre-flight and you can sign up for that for free. And then you just fill in the blanks and it's already done. There are actually a ton of free things like this out there on the internet. You just need to search for them. Now, if you're creating your own, it doesn't have to be that fancy or complicated. It can be as simple as a little notebook and a pen. Now, what are the items to have on this checklist? Write down your name, the date and the time of your flight, the model and the serial number of your drone, check the weather forecast, write the purpose of the flight, check the airspace, which I'll cover here in just a second, inspect your drone and all of its components for good working condition. Oh, and on that note, you should also keep a regular maintenance log of your drone as well. And there's no requirements on how often you need to check everything on your drone, just that you need to have a regular routine of doing it. It can be once a month, it can be once every six months, however you want to do it, but you do need to have that record. And that's where you just check it on a regular basis for any mechanical or functional defects, and then just write it down that you did that inspection. Also for your pre-flight, check your software firmware to ensure that it's up to date and calibrate your compass or your IMU if it prompts you to. And finally, set your return to home altitude. And one more thing that you can add to that list is once you get to the area, you should always kind of survey around you if you've never flown there before to find out what the highest obstacle is in that area. And just make sure that you set that return to home height higher than the highest obstacle. A pre-flight checklist is one of the things that the FAA may ask for. And if you provide it right away, this will already be in your favor because it demonstrates to them that you are consciously making an effort to fly safely. Okay, so let's talk about checking the airspace before you fly. You need to have an app on your mobile device that is used to check the airspace that you're gonna be flying in. Now the two most well-known are AirMap and Kitty Hawk. And I'm gonna tell you about a different one here. It's related to Kitty Hawk in just a second. But these apps show you what airspace you're in, the restrictions that may be in place, and you also use them to apply for Lance approval, which is instant, most of the time, instant authorization to fly where you want to fly. Do this every single time. Even if you're a recreational pilot, apply for Lance authorization. It's another step that's gonna show the FAA that, hey, this guy knows what he's doing and he's trying to fly safely. Now, also, you may have heard of the Before You Fly app. 
And that used to be run by the FAA and it really wasn't a very good app and nobody really used it, but uh, Kitty Hawk owns that app now and it was just updated and it's much, much better. So I would download that one for sure because you can do everything now from the Before You Fly app. I'll say it again, having Lance approval is the number one thing that will demonstrate that you have every intent of conducting a safe and legal flight. Now to avoid this video getting too long, I'm not gonna go through that whole approval process and how you do that, but I will link a video right up here and also in the video description that will show you generally how that works. The next tip is pretty obvious, but once you are in flight, follow the current guidelines that exist when it comes to flying a drone. Of all of the rules for drone pilots, the four most important ones to keep the FAA at bay are keep your drone within visual line of sight, and yes, that means you have to be able to see your drone with the naked eye. That doesn't mean it needs to be in a straight line 5,000 feet away. You have to actually physically be able to see your drone. Number two, don't fly over 400 feet altitude above ground level and don't fly over people and don't fly over emergencies such as fires. It's really pretty simple. You see, here's the thing. In most consumer GPS drones, everything that your drone does while you are flying is being recorded. It's all right there on your drone and it can be accessed easily. Just think of it as a tiny black box that the FAA can access and use to examine your flight and drone behavior. So just keep that in mind all of the time when you're flying, everything is being recorded. Next, let's talk about posting aerial videos online for public access. I'll make this quick. If you are breaking any of those four guidelines I just mentioned, just don't post your video online. It's that simple. Now, if you're following all of the rules and you do post your videos online and you happen to be earning revenue from those postings, then yes, you do need to have a part 107 certificate. YouTube, for one example, is a business and monetized videos do require that a pilot who conducted those flights needs to have a part 107. There's no gray area about it. People say it's kind of a gray area. There really is no gray area. It's pretty black and white. Where it comes down to being gray area is if it's difficult at all for the FAA to prove that the footage that they are seeing is being actually flown by the person that is being accused of doing that flight, then it becomes gray area because they really can't prove who's flying. Even though it's pretty obvious, it has to be black and white. So it really does depend on the video. A good example is live streaming. You may have seen it in the press lately that someone was just fined over $180,000 for live streaming some drone flights without a part 107. Now, hopefully that all works out, but one of these days it's not going to work out because they're going to want to make an example. So if you don't have a part 107, don't live stream your drone flights. Now, do most people who have aerial videos online have a part 107? No, it's not even close, but there are so many. It's pretty much impossible to address them all. And I think, in my opinion, the FAA has much more important things to be concerned with. To date, to my knowledge at least, no one has ever been actually fined and had to pay that fine for posting monetized YouTube videos without a part 107. There have been people that have received a fine, but they've been forgiven after further investigation. And hopefully that happens in this most recent case. If I haven't done my research properly and you do know of anyone that actually had to pay a fine for posting a monetized aerial video, put it down in the comments so we can all learn from it. But if someone reports you, then the FAA is gonna start watching you. And they actually have started to contact people recently. It's becoming more common now. Next, let's talk about where you fly from. Now, no matter what an individual or a business thinks about, if it's illegal for you to fly by their property, they are all wrong. No one owns or governs the airspace above their property. Only the FAA governs airspace, no matter where it is. But when it comes to where you launch from and fly from, property owners have every right to ask you to leave the property. So just be very wary of where you are flying from. Don't fly from private property. Roads and roadsides and sidewalks are public property. They have access, they're called easements. Most parking lots actually are not, they are private property. Flying from public land is the best way to mitigate any issues, especially with local law enforcement. If you're standing on public easement, not flying over people, you can see your drone and it's below 400 feet altitude, you are totally legal. 
Now, if you happen to be flying from a parking lot and someone challenges you on it, simply walk to the sidewalk or the curbside. Now, what I do is I have a laminated form that I carry with me every time that I fly and I can hand to anyone or I leave it on top of my vehicle. And if they approach me, I can just say, hey, go ahead and read that while I land my drone. It states who I am, why I'm flying, my part 107 number, it states the land that I'm on is public, the airspace that I'm in is authorized, and it also states to not engage with me until I have landed my drone. Again, it comes down to preparation. Preparation is the name of the game. Every time you fly, just anticipate that someone may challenge you. It's unfortunate that it has to be like that, but it will protect you in the long run. The last thing that I wanna tell you about and very important thing that you can do to avoid the wrath of the FAA is to be as professional and cordial as you possibly can if they happen to contact you. Their policy demands that they must first inform and educate. And if you accept their contact as an effort to improve your knowledge, then most of the time, everything's gonna work out in your favor. But if you resist and argue, that will put them on the defensive and they will dig their heels in and they will make an example out of you. Now, I'm not suggesting that you roll over. Just be polite. Basic decency is not the same as submitting. It's kind of becoming a lost art these days. So hopefully some of those tips help you someday. And if you received any value today, click on the thumbs up button, subscribe for more videos, comment below if you think there's something maybe that I missed, something that should be added to this list. That way we can all share and learn from each other. Have a great day, everyone. And as always, fly safe and fly smart. Mm -hmm.